Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. If you're wondering, there are only 50 chapters in Genesis, which means we're nearing the end of our journey. We should, and you know, you know me, so hear me, we should only have about two more messages in Genesis. We will see uh, how that plays out, but we will have probably around two more uh, messages in Genesis, and we're nearing the end here. And if you remember, it's been a while since we've been in Genesis, but just try to remember the last time that we were together, uh, Jacob did something very surprising. Jacob actually adopted Joseph's two sons as his own, right? He took Manasseh and Ephraim, and he said, you are going to be not my grandchildren, you are going to be my sons. They were going to replace the firstborn sons of Jacob. And he did something very interesting, you'll remember, because Joseph brings his boys before him, and he's like, all right, here's the oldest, here's the youngest, you know, place the right hand, place the left hand. And Jacob went like this and crossed his hands. And we talked about the fact that he blessed the wrong one, right? He was supposed to bless the oldest one, but instead he blessed the youngest one. And we we're saying, that's how God's blessings often work. They're often the crossed hands of blessing. He doesn't do the things that we necessarily think he should do, the way that we want it to happen or what we expect to happen, but God will do what God wants to do, and it is always the best way. And so Jacob is on his deathbed. He is nearing the end of his life, and he is going to now pronounce blessings upon all of his boys, all 12 of his sons. They're going to come before him, and he is going to pronounce blessings on them. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was the great theologian, Forrest Gump, who said, life is like a box of chocolates. You don't even want them, so you might as well just throw them away, right? <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. And that's kind of what these blessings are like, right? It's a, a mixed bag of blessings because every boy is coming before Jacob going, all right, here's the patriarch. He's got the blessing of God upon him. He has the power and the authority to bless us and pronounce good things over us. So all of them are beginning to line up and they're expecting great things to come from him. And they don't always get that. Some of them do and some of them don't. It's a, a mixed bag of blessings that we're going to see here. And it's a, a really good, interesting way to end the book of Genesis because Genesis is a book about blessing, is it not? We've seen blessing throughout this entire book in this chapter marks a, a pretty significant shift in redemptive history, and I think Mr. McKinney actually talked about it a few weeks ago when he was teaching. It's the fact that, remember, all throughout Genesis, God has pronounced his blessing upon a person, right? The blessing is going to go to Abraham, and from Abraham it's going to pass down to Isaac, and from Isaac it's going to pass down to Jacob. The blessing of God has always rested upon a person and been passed down to a person. But you remember, what did God promise to do for Jacob? This was really interesting. God made Jacob a particular promise. Anybody remember? God promised to make Jacob a people and a company of people. Do you all remember that? And we said, it's interesting, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that word company of people is actually the Greek word ekklesia, which is the Greek word for church. God promised to make a church and bless a church. And now, as we come to Genesis 49, we begin to see that reality take place. The blessing is not going to just rest on one person and pass down to one person. The blessing is going to be upon the company of people, the church. And so as Christians today, when we're reading this, we're reading what it means to actually be part of the people of God. We're reading what it means to actually be blessed of God. What does it mean to be part of God's people? What does it mean to actually be a blessed people? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And I, I really want us to focus on about three things this evening that we can take away from all these blessings. So if you have your Bible... Genesis 49, you're going to need to be looking at it tonight a lot because we're going to be jumping around a good bit. But I want to start in verse 3. Genesis 49 in verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, 
and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Well, you can just stop there, right? You say, thank you very much, Grandpa. I'll take it. Uh, that's good enough for me. Unfortunately, he continues. Verse 4, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence. Preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power, but you will not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into their counsel. O my glory, be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it's, it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So here's something interesting to notice here. You have Reuben the firstborn, and he fell victim to a sinful tendency, right? What was that, that sinful tendency? Lust, right? That's what we would call it. Uh, he fell victim to lust. He actually slept with one of his father's mistresses and he defiled his father's bed and so he disqualified himself from the right of the firstborn. And so you look to the next two boys. Are they any better? No. What's crazy though, think about it like this. Simeon and Levi did something that many people in the world and the culture at the time would have deemed a, a righteous act, a noble act. They were just trying to seek out justice for their sister. You remember that the, the Shechem, they defiled Dinah. It was a terrible trial. I mean, it was brutal rape is what happened to Dinah. And so Simeon and Levi decided, you're not going to do that to our sister. They get their swords, they go into Shechem, and they kill everybody and rob all the houses. The world would have applauded them. But the Bible says here, it was sinful anger. And it wasn't just, they weren't motivated by righteous justice and wanting to the right or wrong done to their sister is that their hearts had a bloodlust about it. They wanted to kill people. They were angry and vengeful. And so you see that the first three sons of Jacob all failed to receive the blessing that they thought they were going to get. They, they hear Jacob's got blessings for everybody, but they don't necessarily get what they think they're going to get. And it, it gets, you know, there's a few more of these like this too. Look at, skip down to verses 14 and 15, if you will. Verses 14 and 15, this is what it says of another son. Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. Well, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. In other words, here's what's going to happen with Issachar and the tribe of Issachar. They get this beautiful portion of land. And they think, this place is amazing. It's flowing with milk and honey. Everything's good about this place. But then the Canaanites came in. And the, the tribe of Issachar had to make a decision. Are we going to fight for our land? Are we going to try to remain a distinctive people and be the distinctive people of God that we're called to be? Or are we going to join ourselves to the Canaanites? And what they do is they willingly submit themselves as slaves to the Canaanites just so they can keep their beautiful portion of land. They were compromising, willing to put down the distinctiveness that God called them to have as his people just so that they could keep a beautiful piece of land. And there's a, a worse one still. Look at verses 16 and 18. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider falls backwards. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Now, yeah, Mr. McKinney's giving me a look because he knows. <laughs> he knows. There's a lot of debate about these verses, aren't there, Mr. McKinney? A lot of debate about these verses. Uh, one obvious observation to notice is that Dan is referred to as a serpent. But not just a serpent. Did you notice He's referred to as a serpent who bites at heels. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Ringing any Genesis bells in your ears? Where have we heard almost that exact phrase before? 
Yeah, in Genesis chapter 3. When you hear that in Genesis 3.15, as Joseph just said, the, the, the first, the proto-gospel, the first gospel where God says, hey, listen, there's going to be an offspring who's going to come from the woman, and here's what he's going to do. The serpent is going to bite his what, church? His heel. But ultimately, the offspring will crush his head. This is the only two times those phrases occur in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, a serpent that's biting the hill, and then Dan is referred to as a serpent that bites at the hill. Uh, so, what does that mean? You know, well, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of debate. Um, one interpretation says that it means that the tribe of Dan is going to be particularly influenced by Satan and his rule. That they, more than all the other tribes, are going to be under the influence of Satan. And if you look at you know, the history of the people of Israel, that's not far off. I mean, Dan... Uh, they weren't known for having the best judges. They weren't known as the nicest people. And they probably more than any other tribe struggled with idolatry and child sacrifice. And so they, it seems, were under the influence of Satan probably more than any of the other tribes were. Uh, they also, this interpretation speculates, if you did your homework that Mr. McKinney gave us, there was one tribe missing from the book of Revelation when there's the named and sealed tribes in the book of Revelation. And that is the tribe of... Dan. And so this interpretation would say that the reason Dan is excluded is because he, in some way, that tribe was affiliated with Satan to the point that they were not among those named and sealed uh, in the book of Revelation. Is that what this means? I don't know. We'll have to ask Jesus one day when he calls us to glory. Uh, but it's okay not knowing. The, the point is this, though, that we need to focus on is that Dan, too, is another son who does not receive the blessing that he thought he was going to receive. That's the point that we need to focus on. Whatever else it might mean, here we have another son of a patriarch, a grandson of a patriarch who is not receiving uh, what he is supposed to receive or thinks he should receive. And, and so we're, we're looking at all this and, and we wonder, well, what's the big deal with looking at a few of Jacob's sons who don't receive the blessing that they thought they were going to receive? Well, th the first thing I would point out is I want you to notice something. They are all still included among the people of God here. Are they not? They're being named as Jacob's descendants. They're getting a blessing from their father on his deathbed. They are all still included with the people of God. But I want you to notice this too. And I think this is a really big point here. Is that the people of God or God's people are not immune to sinful tendencies. Are they? Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're made perfect just like that, right? Anybody in here, that how it worked for you? I wish. I wish that were the case, but that's not how it works. You don't turn to faith in Christ and are immediately made perfect. Hey, you could be walking with Jesus for 30, 40, 50 years. Guess what? You're still not perfect. Just because you are a Christian and just because you belong to the people of God does not mean that you are immune to sinful tendencies. And we see that with a lot of Jacob's children here. But you see it with Reuben and his lust, Simeon and Levi with their anger, Issachar with his conformity, Dan with his susceptibility, even Benjamin. Benjamin, the, the at one point beloved, favored son, is going to be said to be a ravenous wolf who's just constantly fighting with everybody. None of them was immune to sinful tendencies and none of them received what they hoped to receive. So here's the point I want us to take away from this. Here's why it matters for us today. Sin always has consequences. Sin always has consequences. In other words, when you look at the lives of Jacob's sons, a lot of this stuff is from the past, right? Like Reuben. He committed that sin a long, long time ago. And yet, Jacob never forgot it. Jacob knew what he had done. And so even though it was a sin from the past, he's paying for it now, is he not? You, you look at Simeon and Levi, there's a sin from way, way in the past. They thought it was over and done with. They probably got a couple pats on the back for that. They were thinking everything's good. You know who didn't forget? Jacob. And here it is all these years later, and they're paying for it now. A lot of these sins are things that are going to happen in the future. But the point that the Bible wants us to understand here is that sin has 
consequences. The, I've said it many times in the book of Genesis because it keeps coming up, but the, the shadow of sin is long and far-reaching. It doesn't matter if it's something you've done in your past and you think, okay, it's done, it's buried, it's in the past, it's never coming up again. Those things have a way of resurfacing and coming back to bite you later on. Sin always has consequences. Also, I want you to notice this too, church, is that sin always affects more than just the person who commits the sin, doesn't it? I mean, because these things are being said over the namesake of the tribe. But it's getting passed down to the children and the children's children, and the children's 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 children. Other people are going to be suffering the consequences of a sin that Reuben thought he did in secret. It was just Reuben and a mistress in a tent somewhere in the desert. Who's going to know? And now his descendants are going to pay for it. There are many times you think that people don't know about your sin. No one knows about it. It's in my head. It's in secret. I'm, I'm doing a good job hiding it. No one knows about it. Everything done in secret will be brought to light. There is no such thing as a secret sin when it comes to God. And we've talked about that in our gospel groups recently as well. Sin has consequences. It always affects more than just you, and it will be exposed. And one of the greatest things God can do for you now is expose it now so that you can repent of that sin and return to faith in Christ, that you can be, uh, get that sin out of your life. So, so that's the, the main thing I wanted you to, to see there is that as Christians, we don't need to think that we're immune to sinful tendencies. Let's not go around with that air of perfection acting like we're better than everybody else and we can't possibly be tempted by the things that non-Christians could be tempted by. Well, those are the people of the world. Of course they could fall into those things. So can we, Christians. Which means that we need to be all the more diligent in killing sin in our lives and relying on the Holy Spirit to make us more, as Joseph prayed earlier, into the image of Christ. To cling to the grace of God to make us holy as He has called us to be holy. But here's the other thing I want us to notice in these pronouncements that, that Jacob's pronouncing upon his sons is, is in the fact that not only are Christians and God's people not immune to sinful tendencies, but here's the hopeful and good word for us is that God brings forth good even from sin. Here's the verse I want you to look at. Look with me at Genesis 49 and verse 7. We've, we've already read this verse, but I want to look at it in a different light. Genesis 49 and verse 7, Cursed be their anger, so this is over Simeon and Levi, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So, so don't miss this. Levi sinned and didn't receive the blessing that he wanted because of his sin. So he and his tribe were scattered. And again, remember your biblical history. Who, who was the only tribe who didn't receive a portion of the land? The Levites. What did God do? Exactly what he said he was going to do. He scattered them amongst the people. But here's the word of grace for us. It's that the tribe of Levi actually did prove to be mostly faithful to the Lord. They committed themselves to the Lord. They devoted themselves to the Lord. And so the Lord took their sinful circumstances and situations, and what did He do? He redeemed it. He made the Levites the what? The priest. The priestly tribe. And it was good that they were scattered because it meant that they could minister to every single tribe of Israel. And even though they didn't have their own portion of the land, they still were preserved in the land. And preservations were made for them. And so God took this sin of the namesake of the tribe and the sinful consequences that the remaining tribe was in, and He redeemed it for good and for His purposes. He took a bad thing and He made it good. You, you see this again with another of Jacob's sons. Look at Genesis 49, verses 22 to 26. 22 to 26. The blessing over Joseph which is the longest of all the blessings. Could have been any one of his sons. And it's Joseph who receives the longest portion. Look at verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow. A, a, a fruitful bow by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. 
From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father who will help you. By the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above. Blessings of the deep that crouches beneath. Blessings of the breast and of the womb. Blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. What a beautiful blessing to pronounce over Joseph. And just think about what God is doing here. I mean, Joseph had arguably the hardest life of all the brothers, did he not? I mean, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was stripped of his special clothing. He was thrown into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He was betrayed by Potiphar's wife. He was thrown into a prison. He was forgotten by the cake bearer. He was enduring prison. And then finally, after all those years of suffering and hardship and betrayal and hurt, he's elevated to a position of power. And he's ultimately reconciled to his family. And because God was at work in the life of Joseph, and because Joseph remained faithful to the Lord, God used Joseph to preserve the family from famine and actually bless them to the point where the book of Exodus begins with them multiplying greatly, being fruitful and multiplying in this beautiful portion of land. So you know the story, but don't miss what God is doing there. Don't miss the word of grace. God took sinful circumstances and redeemed them, used them for his purposes, brought about good from evil. And that's the whole point of of this section here. I want you to understand this. Our good is the goal of our circumstances. Don't don't miss it. Our good is the goal of our circumstances. Now, don't misunderstand me. You all know me well enough to know I hate the prosperity gospel. So don't misunderstand or misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not saying that God's goal for your life is for you to be happy always, for you to be wealthy always, for you to be prosperous always, for you to get all the desires of your sinful hearts. That's not what I'm saying. I'm opposed to that. What I am saying is no matter what your circumstance is, God's goal for you is good. Do you understand the difference there? That no matter what circumstance you are in, God means it and intends it and uses it for your good as a Christian. So whether that means that your circumstances are pretty bad, so I don't know where you're at this morning, but if you're in a circumstance and you're like, I don't know if this is a good circumstance. Family's falling apart, a lot of drama, we're barely making it financially, everybody's at each other's throats, the world is going to chaos. I don't know if you've seen the news lately. Like, It doesn't seem like there's a pretty good circumstance anywhere going around. I don't know what yours is. Yours might be a circumstance brought about by your own sin. Kind of like Levi. Levi's sin led to his circumstances. So maybe you're in a circumstance and your life's falling apart and it's because of your sin. Or maybe your situation's like Joseph's. It's not your sin that led to your circumstances. It's the sins of others. Someone else betrayed you. Someone else hurt you. Someone else did something to you. No matter which one you find yourself in, whether it's your fault or someone else's fault, I want you to understand God can redeem both of those. God can use both of those for your good. You know that the Bible says that God works in all things for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. The question is, do you actually believe that? The Bible says it, and you know it up here. My question is, do you believe it in here? That no matter where you're at, no matter what you're suffering, no matter what tragedy takes place, you can honestly say, this is for my good and for God's glory. It might take years to see it, like it did for Joseph. You you might just be barely making it enduring and saying, I'm just trusting God. I'm just trying to remain faithful. And you might not know what he was doing until years and years later. But my point is this, folks. God brings forth good, even from sinful circumstances. Even from hard circumstances. I remember when I I tore my MCL, it was a, a pretty traumatic time. It was not fun. It was incredibly painful. And uh, I had to be out of work for quite a long time 
dealing with that process, three knee surgeries, a bunch of physical therapy, all sorts of stuff. And I was thinking, this is terrible. You know, they only give you a portion of your paycheck when you're on disability, and so you're not making the money you were making. You can't go back to work. They won't release you. You can't get the help you need. It was just this terrible situation, and I was in pain constantly. I was thinking, what good is this, Lord? But during that time, I got to focus exclusively on schoolwork. So I was able to do pretty well in school. I was able to get really far ahead in school to the point where I finished most of my classes before they even started, all because I had the time to do that. I was able to build the church a website because I had never done it before, so I was like, oh, I want to learn how to build a website and how to code, and so I did that, and then the church let me build them a website, and it's the website that we have to this day. I had the time to do it because I had torn my MCL. Uh, not only that, but then when we had Judah and we needed someone to stay at home with Judah, well, guess what? Stay at home, dad. I'm Mr. Mom over here with Judah every day for the first six months. I couldn't have done that if I was at work. And he needed it because he had a lot of medical issues then. But I was able to stay at home with him and be with him because I was out of work. I was able to preach more at George's Creek because I had torn my MCL. And I had time to focus on preaching and ministry. So what seemed like a terrible, awful, no good circumstance at the time, looking back, I can see God intended it for good. He brought a lot of good out of my pain and my misery and actually grew me as a Christian. That's what God does, and I don't want you to miss that. Wherever you find yourself this evening, whatever circumstance, I want you to understand, know, and trust that God intends it for your good and his glory. One final thing I want us to see this morning is that God redeems his people from sin. Why don't you look with me at verses 9 through 12. These are a few of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And I say that pretty much about every passage I read in the Bible, but, but these are especially special to me. Uh, verses 9 through 12. Judah, I'll oh, start in verse 8 actually. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding the foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Anybody know why these are special verses here? These are some of the clearest prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. I mean, you read this and you see Jesus. You get Jesus in Genesis 3 you get Jesus here at the end of Genesis. Jesus is in the beginning. Jesus is here at the end. And I would argue Jesus is throughout the entire book of Genesis. But here you see this beautiful prophecy that, that the brothers are going to bow down to Judah. Now, listen, we all know the story. We're overly familiar with the Bible. So again, it's like I said this past Sunday, we miss a lot of the, the you know, originality of, of the, the first time of hearing it. But think about this. Why Judah? He's not the firstborn. He's not even the secondborn. He's not the thirdborn. He's the fourth. Why should it be him? Now you might say, well, pastor, didn't you just tell us that the first three were no good rotten scoundrels and they disqualified themselves? Kind of. And so you might be thinking, well, naturally it went to Judah. But hold on a second. Remember what happened. Jacob adopted Manasseh and Ephraim as his own children and they replaced his firstborns, and he spe specifically blessed Ephraim. So here's the thing. If there was going to be anybody from whom the Messiah should come, the special son, it should be Ephraim. So again, why Judah? Anybody know? That's right. <laughs> That's the only answer. I, I don't know any other reason other than God in his sovereign decision decided it's going to be Judah. That is the one that he decided he was going to put his blessing on and make his special tribe. And he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. 
It's amazing. He's saying this is going to be the tribe of kings and rulers, of, of nobility. They are going to rule a future kingdom that isn't even set up yet. They're just 12 brothers hanging out in a foreign land. And yet, they're told here, there's going to be a kingdom. There's a scepter. And it's not going to depart. And I don't know what your translation looks like, but verse 10 is pretty interesting because uh, a lot of the translations differ. But if I was translating this from Hebrew, it would, said, uh, it would say, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be His. The way that it's written there, it, it can be translated a number of ways, but I, I think one of the most faithful ways is that key difference there at, at the ending where it says, until He to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be His. In other words, the Bible is saying here, there's going to come one from the tribe of Judah. Uh, to him is going to be the power and the authority, the kingship, tribute, and obedience. It's the promise of God here at the end of Genesis to undo sin's curse. The, the curse that has loomed over the entire story of Genesis from the beginning. The, the curse that was pronounced upon people in creation all the way back in Genesis 3. The curse that God promised to undo even there in Genesis 3, as Joseph said in Genesis 3.15, where God promised that offspring who would come and undo sin's curse, who would crush the head of the serpent. And God says here, He's coming from Judah. And when He comes, He's going to hold the scepter. And it will not depart from Him. And people are going to give Him tribute. And they're going to give Him honor and praise and glory and obedience. Why? Because He deserves it. It is to Him and for Him and through Him. It is all about Him. It's a beautiful prophecy of the Messiah who is to come. And there's a message for the church here today. I don't want you to miss it. This is what the Bible is wanting us to understand. It's freedom. Freedom from sin is found in Jesus alone. That's what the message is for the church today. We know it's a prophecy. We know it's talking about Jesus. We know He's going to fulfill all these things. But don't miss the significance. God is saying, I know the curse still exists. I know that even among these 12 brothers, there are those with sinful tendencies, like we have today, right? We're no better than them. Don't think that we are. There are those who mess up and make mistakes. There is still a world that is corrupted by sin. Romans 8 says that the creation is groaning waiting for the revelation of the sons of glory and, and for Jesus to return. God is saying here at the end, I know that this world is still contaminated and corrupted by sin, but here is the reality. Freedom from that sin is found in this one. This one who is coming from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the Bible tells us, you can look at Psalm 110, another one of my favorite passages, that the Lord is sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. His scepter comes forth from Zion. Rule in the midst of your people. So you put this together, what does it mean? It means Jesus is ruling and reigning today. He is still seated on the throne he is holding the scepter. He is ruling in the midst of His people. His kingdom is going forward. His gospel cannot be stopped. He will receive the glory and praise and honor and obedience that He deserves. And the first step to all of that happening is to find freedom from sin. You will not praise Jesus as He deserves. You will not glorify Him as He deserves. You will not give him tribute or obedience as he deserves if you are still under the reign of sin. You cannot serve two masters. The Bible says here there's freedom. Freedom in Christ. Freedom in this one who crushed the head of the serpent so that you don't have to face the penalty of sin. And that's a good, good message for us today. That's good word. It's hope for us today that no matter how much we are tempted you have freedom in Christ. No matter what temptations you face or come your way, you have freedom in Christ. 
No, no matter when you think about your past and the penalty and the punishment that you deserve, listen to me, brother and sister in Christ, you have freedom in Christ. You don't have to fear punishment. You don't have to fear wrath. You have been set free. And the Bible says if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Praise the Lord for that. The other word I want to just leave you with today, it's not even in my notes, but I think it needs to be said, is when you do look at this world that is still corrupted by sin and contaminated by sin, when you look at the rulers of our world, the presidents, the kings, the dictators, you, you look at all these people and how sinful they are thinking in their, in their ways and all the, the sinful rules that they put out and the laws that are going forward. You look at the morality of even our own country where California will say it's immoral to gamble on sports, but if you want to kill a baby as they're coming out of a woman, do it. That's how twisted our morality is in this country. It's wrong to gamble. It's fine to kill babies. You look at the wars and the rumors of wars. You listen to the threats of nuclear war coming our way. Invasions potentially happen. You look at cyber security threats and hacking. And you say, this whole world is descending into chaos. This whole world is going down. You look at people persecuting the church today. You look at the amount of Christian martyrs today. You look at people who are hunting down Christians to kill them today. You look at bans on churches gathering today for worship. And you say, this whole thing's going to disappear. Not only is the world corrupt, but the church is going down with it. Notice what the Bible says here. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Do you ever need a moment of hope? There's your moment of hope right there. It doesn't matter what North Korea does or Iran does. It doesn't matter who threatens us, what China's up to. None of that matters. Jesus is seated on the throne. Jesus will rule. The gospel will go forward. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And it has nothing to do with us or how smart we are, how wise we are, or how strategic we are. It has to do with the fact that the lion of the tribe of Judah is seated on the throne and the scepter will not depart from his hand. He will have the glory and honor and obedience that he deserves. Amen? All right, let's have a word of wisdom.